Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Yeager, Director of Heritage Programs for Missouri Humanities. We are a member supported organization and our mission is to enrich lives and strengthen communities by connecting Missourians with the people, places and ideas that shape our society. To those of you turning in for the first time, welcome. And to those of you that are returning for another fun Wednesday afternoon, welcome back. And thanks for joining us for chapter five of this 10 part virtual storytelling journey that brings the book, Growing Up With The River, Nine Generations on the Missouri to life. Growing Up With The River by Dan and Connie Burkhart explores our state's rich cultural heritage through the eyes of nine generations of children growing up in river towns along the Missouri River. Each of the 10 chapters will be presented by a storyteller and special guests. The series will run every Wednesday at 4 p.m. on Facebook Live, ending on September 30th. Today, we will explore Marthasville, Piers, and Trelor in 1904. With the opening of the Katy Railroad in the 1890s, these small communities became part of a new, larger world. Towns sprung up around grain elevators every 10 miles or so in the flat river bottom. The railroad brought goods from the city while gathering local grain and livestock to take to faraway markets. The feared flooding of the bottomlands was a constant worry. I'm honored and super excited to introduce our special storytellers for today's chapter because they are none other than the book's authors, Dan and Connie Burkhart. Dan and Connie have a farm near the Missouri River west of St. Louis and work to conserve the land along the Katy Trail. They co-founded Magnificent Missouri to focus attention on the remarkable culture, history, and landscape of the Missouri River Valley from Herman to the Confluence. Later on, we'll hear more from Dan and Connie about how all of this led to their writing of Growing Up With The River. After Dan and Connie finish, we will introduce our special guests for this chapter. We would like to once again thank Dan and Connie for writing such a wonderful book and for entrusting us to share these stories. And also thanks to artist Brian Haynes for allowing us to share his beautiful illustrations. Please let us know that you're watching by asking questions and leaving comments on the Facebook feed. In partnership with Higher Education Channel, HEC-TV, St. Louis Storytelling Festival, Missouri History Museum, and Magnificent Missouri, we present Growing Up With The River. Good afternoon. This chapter takes place in 1904. Last year's flood still had everyone talking. The river had carved new channels and roared through places along the river bottom where it had never been before. Father read the Marthasville record to the children while Opa read the Warrington Volksfreund in German. But the girl didn't have to read to know how powerful the river was. She could see it. The river had torn up the new Katy Railroad like the tracks were toys. And the people just downstream in Washington counted more than a hundred houses floating past the riverfront. Hogs and chickens clung to trees and timbers as they floated downstream. The flood was more than a year ago, and as she poked around the sandy channels at the river's edge, she found new treasures all the time. Today, she discovered a shovel stuck in the mud at the base of an old bur oak tree. Her parents always said that the cropland that grew the corn oats and wheat along the river was some of the best in Missouri. But every year they worried about the floods. Father worked hard to plant the seed, walking behind their plow horse, Louie. And after a shower of rain, the tiny corn plants would pop up in straight rows. The sun shone and the corn grew, but her parents always watched the skies. All of the farmers worried about the river covering their fields and destroying their crops. While she truly loved the river, her family hated the river because of the floods. Fortunately, they lived on a hill farm at the edge of the bluffs overlooking the river bottom farmland. The flooding caused problems for their bottom land fields, but their house, barns, chicken coops, and equipment were safe from high water. In the bottomland, everyone knew it was all at risk of being washed down river. Even a neighborhood church, St. John's, had to be moved farther from the river because it was in danger of falling in during the flood. Secretly, 
secretly. She looked forward to the floods. She and her brothers whooped and chased catfish and perch in the fields. Sometimes a big sturgeon would be trapped in shallow water as the flood waters receded. It was fun to hunt for fish on the land. When she looked out over the river valley, she felt all of the excitement of living near the Missouri. Expansive golden wheat fields filled the river bottom. And after harvest, wheat filled the grain elevators in Marthasville, Piers, and Trelor. She could hear the steamboats whistling as they came into river towns and trains blowing, clanging, and booming into town with goods of all kinds. She imagined long ago Osage Indians walking through the prairie, and her grandparents said that Lewis and Clark had camped nearby. In St. Louis right now, they were celebrating the 100th anniversary of their trip. If only the river would behave and stay where it belonged, her home place would be perfect. It would be heaven on earth. Instead, her grandmother was always saying, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Every time it flooded, she couldn't stand to hear any more about the floods. After school most days, she walked down the hill to Glossmeyer's store to visit and to see if the train had brought any exciting mail to the post office. Yesterday, she told Mr. Glossmeyer that she was hoping the train would bring two things in the mail. First, she really wanted the Sears Roebuck catalog. The Sears catalog was enormous and it had hundreds of pages of things that were not available anywhere else. Talking machines, colorful buggies with gold trim, Basketballs and hoops could be ordered and delivered by the U.S. Post Office to your house or to the train station. Mr. Glossmeyer joked, Are you trying to put me out of business? He knew there were things in the Sears catalog he could never stock, including whole houses in pieces that came on a railroad car. Sorry, you'll have to wait a couple more months for the Sears catalog. What's your other wish for the mail? Okay, I'm hoping, hoping, hoping for a postcard from my aunt who's at the World's Fair in St. Louis. Hmm, a postcard from St. Louis? You want some news from the fair? Let me see. He walked past the post office to the back room and called up the stairs. Helen, will you please come down to visit with a friend of mine and please bring the salt and pepper shakers. His cousin Helen came down the stairs and set the most beautiful ruby red glass salt and pepper shakers on the table. These are my favorite souvenirs from the World's Fair. Look, they're engraved. The girl was in awe. Were all of the salt and pepper shakers in St. Louis like jewels? Cousin Helen told her that she could hold them if she was careful. Then she talked all about her train ride to St. Louis and said that she had spent three entire days at the fair. She saw displays from all over the world. The buildings were big and ornate with spectacular fountains with crystal clear water running through them. And by some magic, the muddy river water had been made to run bright and clear. But I can't even describe all the things I saw. The lights there run on electricity. And I had an ice cream cone every day. It was the sweetest, coldest treat I've ever eaten. Mr. Glossmeyer said that he wanted to sell ice cream in his store someday. Helen said that the World's Fair was like a museum, but even better. She had seen a display with a stuffed passenger pigeon and even some passenger pigeon eggs that had been collected years before, she turned to her cousin. Remember how grandfather told us about passenger pigeons? He said there were flocks that were so large that they darkened the sky. And the flocks broke the limbs of the large trees they roosted in and now they're gone. And the only place on earth to see them is in a display at the World's Fair or in a zoo. It's very sad. Then his cousin surprised the girl by saying that her very favorite part of the fair was seeing the Missouri Corn Palace. The Corn Palace was an entire building made of all different kinds of corn grown on farms in Missouri. I was so proud to see all that corn, and I know that some of it was from right here in our river bottom. I saw the enormous display of corn cob pipes from the factory in Washington, and there was a proclamation that named them best corn cob pipes in the world. Sadly, it was close to supper time, so the girl thanked Helen over and over for sharing her stories and her souvenirs. 
She said, you were the best postcard ever. As she walked back up the hill with her stories, she thought of all the places that she would travel when she was older. In the meantime, it was fun to just plan her next walk down the railroad tracks with her Opa. She did not need to travel for an adventure because on Saturdays, they'd take the buggy to the grain elevator to watch the train unload its freight. When the harvest season rolled around, they'd see the corn and wheat being loaded. The elevators were the tallest buildings around and during harvest season, horse-drawn wagons lined up to send off a year's worth of plowing, planting, and harvesting. Every year, the crop grew larger as more trees were cut and more of the forested river bottom was cleared to become farmland. As they washed the dishes after supper, mother asked her what she learned in school that day. Instead, she told her all about the World's Fair. Mother said, well, that's a very interesting story, but what did you learn in school? In geography, she learned that only four states had more people than Missouri, New York, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. But we're growing fast because of the river, she told her mother. There were smaller states like swampy Florida or dried out California, but they were hard to reach by railroad or river. With steamboats and now railroads, St. Louis and Missouri were able to ship goods all over the country. Plus new stores and towns were springing up all along the rails. Missouri was a big state and growing. Mother put down the dish rag and gave her a hug. You really paid attention to your studies and you also learned a lot from your new friend who went to the World's Fair. I learned a lot too. Now it's time for a bath so you can be ready for another big day tomorrow. Say good night to everyone and I'll come say your prayers with you in a little bit. Missouri is growing, but so are you. And it's time for bed. Dano, scoot in here. You know that I love the 1904 chapter. And when you wrote this chapter, when you wrote the book, what did you really hope that readers would experience from this chapter? What we wanted people to do was read this book and then want to explore the places talked about in it. In every one of our 10 chapters, there are physical places. In this one, the Pier store that still exists that we talked about in the book and we told stories about them. that begins in the first chapter in 1806 and it continues right through the end of the book. And in fact, even looking ahead to 2040, we talk about specific places that we want people to get out and see along the Missouri River and the Katy Trail. So throughout the entire book and growing up at the river, there are things that we can experience, but some things Sadly, like the passenger pigeons or others. Carolina parakeets. Carolina parakeets that we can't experience. And one of the things that the girl hears in this okay. chapter, she hears the whistle of the steamboats. During this period, there was, for a brief period of time, a truly wonderful thing on the Missouri River. And it was called the Wonderland Floating Theater. And the Wonderland Floating Theater went up and down the lower Missouri River and pulled into river towns and offered all kinds of entertainment. If you can picture this area at that point in time, there were really no roads. There were no cars. There was no way to see entertainment. There were no theaters. The Wonderland Floating Theater brought Shakespeare. It brought comedies. It brought poetry and circuses and performers to these river towns. It would pull into a small town and blast on its calliope, its loud whistle, and farmers would hear it five miles off the river, and they would come to the riverfront and have an evening of entertainment. It was truly uh, an amazing thing, and it lasted for a few years, and it was uh, talked about in our book and uh, thought of very fondly by the people who lived there. Oh, it's so quirky and unique to Missouri. Okay, so in that circumstance, the river is a friend and a source of entertainment and fun. But in most of this chapter, the river is a foe. It's a, it's a tough neighbor. The river created the great wealth that this area had. It, over centuries and centuries, deposited some of the richest soil in the Midwest and created a remarkable growing environment for agricultural products. But uh, the flip side of that was that it created awful flooding for the farmers who made their money there. And 
one writer at the time referred to it as the hungriest river because it ate thousands of acres of farmland, barns, fences, houses, crops. It couldn't eat enough. The Missouri River was used to rampaging all over a four to five mile wide river bottom. And when farmers started growing crops there, it wasn't compatible with modern day agriculture. So what our characters in this chapter experienced was something that would be dealt with in the future. And these are stories we tell throughout our book in terms of situations that are created, conditions that are created during one generation that are dealt with by future generations. And that's exactly what happened here. There had to be a way to deal with this flooding, and there was. So when you were writing this book, I learned so much from the research that you did. And as the Missouri Humanities Council has produced this series, I've learned so much too. But one of the things when we're out in piers and we're looking at the river bottom and people are talking about the bottom farms, it's so interesting because the Missouri River changed course in a major way. And so literally, some of the farmers in that neck of the woods are farming what was previously the bottom of the Missouri River. So the rich nutrients and everything are particularly stunning out in that part of the Missouri River Valley. Now, the flooding was certainly a dark, dark chapter for these farmers, but 1904 was really a golden era for Piers, Trelor, Marthasville. And when you and Brian were collaborating for the painting to introduce this chapter, you really brought some great ideas together. Yeah, this was the best of times for St. Louis and for Missouri. 1904 was the zenith, uh, for the goods and products and services going west on the Missouri River and on the railroad tracks on both sides of the river. It was, uh, we were at that time kind of the Silicon Valley of, of America. We were the place to be. And when Brian and I talked about illustrating this chapter, we, we chose to do it uh, in, a, in a really fun, whimsical way that Brian only could create. It shows the arrival of the Katy Railroad to the River Valley. It shows agriculture taking place and the pier store as it looked in 1904 and pretty much as it looks today. And at that time, there was also a large grain elevator there. And uh, Brian has come up with the idea of some ballerinas performing on a show horse on the Wonderland Floating Theater overlooking it all. So this captures the spirit and the energy of what was happening then. And with this, Caitlin, I want to send it back to you, but I want to first thank you. Connie and I couldn't be more pleased that the Missouri Humanities Council has selected our book to do this wonderful project with. This, when we wrote it, this is what, is what we'd hoped would happen. We had hoped that it would have a life other than just within the covers of the book. And the Humanities Council has truly brought it to life and, and we greatly appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you guys so much. We, uh, we are equally as pleased that you've given us the liberty to, to take this project and run with it. So uh, many thanks to you guys as well and, and for creating the content. You know, you guys wrote the book, we're just putting it out there. So. So thank you guys so much and thanks for reading and for sharing a little bit of background about your inspiration for the book and, and your hopes for it. Um, and I hope that the, the series continues to make you happy. So our first special guest is Steve Schnarr, Executive Director of Missouri River Relief. Missouri River Relief is a nonprofit based in Columbia, Missouri that is dedicated to connecting people to the Missouri River through river cleanups, education programs and recreation. Steve will share a little background on how the U.S. government and individual farmers and levee districts reshaped the Missouri River floodplain to reduce the damage caused by flooding to agricultural lands during the past century. So with that, Steve, I will send it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Caitlin. And um, thank you, Dan and Connie, for sharing these stories, for writing them and kind of conjuring up um, 
these characters that just bring the, the landscape to life and they bring the history of the area to life. Um, like we're all part of that history. And it's like when I read those stories, I just, I kind of feel this kinship with, with all those people and those different times and their relationship to the river. Um, so yeah, I am gonna talk a little bit about some of the changes that have been done to the Missouri River. The, the Missouri River that ran through our state 100 years ago was very different from the river that we have today. When you sit on the banks now or float on its strong current, you can tap into that old ancient river and feel that same power. But we're gonna spend a little time exploring some of the changes that we've made to the river since then. Some of these were done by local residents in the floodplain and some were done by the federal government to the river itself. This painting was done by Carl Bodmer, a Swiss artist who traveled up the Missouri River on the Yellowstone, which was the first steamboat to make it up the Missouri River all the way to South Dakota. You can see in this painting how different and treacherous the river looked then, with many islands and braided channels full of snags which are giant trees and logs embedded in the bottom of the river. The river had a well-earned reputation for being very difficult to navigate. Of the 600 steamboats that worked on the Missouri River, 400 of them eventually sank there, which is two out of every three. Um, and those are kind of the odds that we don't play with these days, right? Um, if you hopped on an airplane knowing that there was a two out of three chance that you might not make it to your destination, Chances are you wouldn't hop on that airplane. Um, now this, this next slide is a map of the Missouri River in 1894, um, which is 10 years before the story that Dan and Connie just wrote, and it's 126 years ago. This map is showing the same stretch of river that those stories were written about. Um, at the right and the bottom is Washington, Missouri, and at the top edge, is Marthasville, um, and this, this map really reveals the braided nature of the river then with shifting channels and many sandbars and islands. Can you imagine trying to boat up the Missouri River looking like this, trying to figure out which of the many different channels was the one that you should take? Now here's a little quote from an article that was written in 1907 by George Fitch. This article was called The Missouri River, Its Habits and Eccentricities Described by a Personal Friend. It is a perpetual dissatisfaction with its bed that is the greatest peculiarity of the Missouri. It's harder to suit in the matter of beds than a traveling man. Time after time, it's gotten up out of its bed in the middle of the night with no apparent provocation and has hunted up a new bed, all littered with forests, cornfields, brick houses, railroad ties, and telegraph poles. It's flopped into this prickly mess with a gurgle of content and has flowed along placidly for years, gradually assimilating the foreign substances and wearing down the bumps in its alluvial mattress. Then it has suddenly taken a fancy to its old bed, which by this time has been filled with suburban architecture and back it's gone with a whoop and a rush, as happy as it had found something really worthwhile. Quite naturally, this makes life along the Missouri a little bit uncertain. Ask the citizen of a Missouri river town on which side of the river he lives, and he will look worried and will say, well, on the east side when I came away, then he'll go home to look the matter up, and like it is not, we'll find the river on the other side of his humble home, and a government steamboat pulling snags out of his erstwhile cabbage patch. It makes farming as fascinating as gambling, too. You never know whether you're going to harvest corn or catfish. Now this uh, next map is just kind of zooming in on that first map. So we're looking a little closer. Again, this is 1894 and the arrow is showing us the location of the Pierce store that Dan and Connie talked about and where Magnificent Missouri has its conservation outpost on the Katy Trail these days. At that time, the store was a stone's throw from the river. In the flood of 1903, the main channel of the river, called Emily's Bend on this map, up and moved right away from piers, forever banishing the store from the banks of the river. It just moved to the other side of the valley. After many years of such flooding, farmers began trying to protect their low lands from the power of the river. 
They first began pushing berms of dirt into low-lying areas, trying to tie together high spots with rows of sand and mud. These could help keep fields dry in a normal year, but in a flood year, all bets were off. As floods kept occurring, towns and farmers started building real levees. These are engineered berms of sand and clay built high in the floodplain to protect fields and towns. Farmers banded together with others in the floodplain to form levee districts, and they would tax themselves to pay for building and maintaining levees, and, and that is the structure that still continues on today. However, as one side of the river built a levee, that would cause more flooding on the other side. So then an arms race of levees began, each bottom land trying to build higher than the next one. So in the effort to stop flooding in one place, it merely pushed the problem and the river itself onto someone else's land. Eventually, the Federal Emergency Management Agency stepped in and stopped levee districts from building their levees higher. Now, as river flows continue to change with climate change causing more rainfall, and development and agricultural drainage causing more runoff, some levees are getting overtopped more often. Plus, when the river's high, even a functioning levee will trap rainwater behind it or even allow the river to seep underneath it. Last year near Marthasville, the river was high all year. The levees were not overtopped, but many fields flooded anyway from seep water or water backed up from local rainfall. Now, an even bigger change to the river happens beginning in the 1920s. In order to make the river more easy to navigate and to keep it from wandering all around the river bottoms, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers began to channelize the Missouri River. They took a wide, shallow, meandering river and squeezed it, making it narrower and faster. These next few, sl few slides show how that happened. This slide shows an area called Indian Cave Bend in Nebraska, a little bit north of where the Missouri River enters the state of Missouri. You can see the multiple channels and the sand islands. It's tough to see where the main channel of the river is. This picture was taken in 1934 and we're looking downstream. Now that fall, the Corps of Engineers started building pile dikes which are rows of wooden pilings pounded down into the bottom of the river. Some of these are parallel to the flow of the river, like that long one that you see in the bottom left corner. And they designate where the core wants the new river bank to be. Others are called wing dikes and they're perpendicular to the river. They slow the water and they push the current to the opposite side. Now, just one year later, the area between the wing dikes is filling with sediment. Just like if you shake up a bottle of muddy water and then let it settle and then set it down to settle, when the wing dikes slow the muddy water, it drops its silt load, gradually forming new land. So one more year and that newly formed land is building up more and it's starting to grow trees. Now it's 1936. The islands are beginning to disappear as the channel has shifted to the left side. Now we are 10 years later, 1946, and all that newly formed land is now a forest. The process of channelization created a new river that was about one third as wide as it was before. Some of those wing dikes are now underground, buried beneath several feet of mud and sand. So the river is now more stabilized, but in the process, there's less room to carry those big floodwaters. Now jumping ahead 30 more years to 1977, that forest is now gone and the land is farmed right up to the riverbank. The new land was gifted to the adjacent landowner, free land. Woo. Now this slide is taken in 2013, a couple years after the massive 2011 flood. Now you can see where a levee has been built to protect the farmland. But if you recall, this levee is built where the river actually used to be. You can see evidence of where the levee was overtopped in 2011, scouring away the farmland and creating that new small lake next to the levee. The river is also 
kind of eroding and chewing away at the riverbank that uh, the new riverbank that was created a few decades before. So now we're going to jump from this slide to the original slide so you can really see that transformation. Again, this is the same location back in 1934 um, before the channelization. Now, in a big flood, levees are bound to be overtopped. When that happens, the taller the levee, the more damage will be done to the land it was supposed to protect. In a levee breach like this one, a giant scour hole is often dug out by the force of the water pouring over that levee. Some scours, scour holes after the 2019 flood were over 60 feet deep. Now, now going back to that original map from 1894 showing that braided wild Missouri River near Marthasville and Piers. Now the next slide will show the channelized engineered river of today so we can kind of compare the two of them. It seems that every step that's taken to protect from floods in most years causes much bigger changes and even damage in really high water years. It is such a balancing act, but the river always wins in the end. So again, this is the river of today laid over that old river map. And now we're gonna just jump to that old map one more time so you can kind of see the comparison between the two. And uh, that's all I've got for right now. I hope if you guys have any questions that you'll go ahead and stick them in the comment field and we can get to them at the end of the presentation. Um, thanks, Caitlin. Thank you, Steve. That was cool. I knew very little about all the changes the Missouri River has seen over the years and, and uh, very interesting and we appreciate you taking the time to talk about um, talk about something as important to our state as the river. Um, our last guest this afternoon is Ralph Bremer. He is the Executive Director for Magnificent Missouri. Ralph joined Magnificent Missouri as the organization's first executive director in 2019, and he is here today to expand a bit on Piers and Prelor, two of the towns mentioned in this week's chapter. And he'll also talk a bit about Magnificent Missouri's Country Store Corridor. So Ralph, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Caitlin. Hi, everybody. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, my name is Ralph Fremer, and I am the executive director of Magnificent Missouri. I have the pleasure of working with Dan and Connie, helping to celebrate uh, the book Growing Up with the River. Uh, it's really quite amazing what this book has done uh, for the communities in telling the story uh, about Missouri River Country, specifically the last 100 miles of Missouri River Country, which is kind of the area where we focus. Um, it's a wonderful tool and we use it to educate kids and their families about the importance of preserving history, um, the culture, deep rooted culture and the landscape that Steve was talking about uh, of Missouri River Country. Um, but I also get to help introduce lots and lots of people, kids and their families, uh, seniors, um, to our own, what we call Missouri's backyard. Um, it's located right here in the center of our own countryside. Um, it's what we call uh, the Country Store Corridor, what's, what Steve had mentioned. Uh, it's, 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 it's fun to, to, to create that brand of a place because it really is remarkable. And a lot of work has gone into preserving those ideals. It's a real life, hands-on example of what life was like back in the day. Um, and it's right along the Katy Trail, formerly the Missouri, Kansas, Texas Railroad, and right along the river. Um, but the book Growing Up With The River is just one way that Dan and Connie have made an impact. Um, they've also worked tirelessly to preserve buildings and chronicle the history and the landscape of this corridor. Um, it's for all of us to enjoy, uh, for our families and their families and other generations to come. And that's that's why we're purposed. Um, you can put that next slide up. Um, our, our mission is to conserve and increase appreciation of the Katy Trail uh, and the last 100 miles as it goes from Herman all the way down to the confluence where the Mississippi River meets and it flows all the way down south. Um, as a premier regional asset through education, events, and collaborative projects. Well, what does that mean? 
It means that we want to encourage you and your families to experience, connect, and help preserve the beautiful landscape and rich history of the Missouri River Valley along with us. We want your participation. It's a lot of fun. Um, next slide, please. So let's give you a little perspective. Um, the map on the left is uh, kind of similar to one of the maps that uh, Steve had. It's uh, about 200 years forward. Uh, if you look at the little red area, um, this the, the map depicts 100 miles. Herman's on your left and the confluence is on your right. And with that little red area there, if you go over to the, the photo on your right, it kind of depicts the country store corridor. Um, it's from Herman to the confluence. It's historic. Uh, it's where the Missouri River, the Katy Trail come together, passing all the scenic bluffs, all the farm fields and the historic railroad towns. It's a very special place. This photo um, was taken from far above and used with GIS mapping technology. So we, uh, we get the benefit of that. Um, next slide. So um, a quick, a little bit about uh, Magnificent Missouri. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. We're focused on fun ways to improve co the community's appreciation of, of the Missouri River country. Um, we're only successful um, if, we, if you join us, if you join us in conserving, if we inspire you and your friends and family to help protect the land, plant trees and help invasive species, we feel we're winning. If, if it's only successful if we get you to explore along with us, um, increase your appetite for visiting the Katy Trail, encourage you to tell all the people that you know to come and explore the historic towns and specifically what we call the Country Store Corridor. Um, we want you to engage. We're successful if we get you to engage, to volunteer. We'd like to get you and your friends and your family to help promote it. Um, just like with this series, uh, where there's a lot of sharing going on in social media, we really appreciate shares. So telling our story, looking at, at the land and the culture and the history and preserving it for years to come. We're successful if we do that. So we need your help. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, we can, can we go back one? There we go. So first up, uh, on, the, on our map, you know, you're basically, we're gonna move from east to west, but as you come down off of the bluffs, just west of, of Augusta, you'll see the ta little town of Dutzo. It's originally called the Village of Dutzo, and it was founded by Baron Johann Wilhelm von Brock in 1834. This was the place that became the Mecca for all the Germans that immigrated in the 1930s as a place to live that was similar to their homeland in Germany. When the railroad came through in 1893, businesses located closer to the railroad for convenience. The little village grew, and today there are still many buildings depicting the life in the early 1900s. And that's the post office right there on the left, and that's one of the uh, Katy Trail trailheads there on the right there. So it's, it's kind of the entryway into the country store corridor, and a remarkable point of interest as it relates to German heritage. Next slide, please. Just to the west, uh, not too far, is Marthasville. Uh, so Daniel Boone and his family came to the area uh, that was later known as Marthasville in 1799. It was a French trading post uh, called La Charette back then. Flanders Calloway and his wife Jemima Boone, Daniel and Rebecca's daughter, built a house just outside of town. Marthasville is still that quaint little commerce hub along the Katy Trail. It has a wonderfully shaded trailhead uh, on the Katy due to the ongoing tree planting efforts by that town and by Mag Magnificent Missouri and others. The original graves of Daniel Boone and his wife Rebecca are located there just outside of Boone Monument Village. Now you can see Boone Monument Village if you're on 94 and you look to your right and you'll see teepees over in the, in the, in the horizon. Uh, remarkable place. They have buildings back there dating back to the 1700s. Really a good place to stop on the corridor. Next slide, please. Um, so this is our favorite, obviously, uh, Pierce Store. You probably hear a little bit about Pierce Store from time to time because we think it's, it's one of the more hands-on places. We call it our conservation outpost. It was built for the arrival of the Katy Tra Railroad in 1896 and now on the National Register of Historic Places. Huge achievement. The Pierce Store is a prime example of what conservation and preservation along the Katy Trail looks like when it's accomplished. 
from the live local music on the porch to the four acre, acre Pierce Prairie across the street and the Katy Trail itself, the Pierce store continues to hold a special place in the history of the Missouri River Valley and is truly a gem in the heart of Missouri countryside. One more slide. Um, and this is my kind of my personal favorite because I've been planting a lot of trees out there and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful backdrop to what Missouri River Country was like back in the old days. The Trelor Mercantile served many purposes for the town of Trelor in its 120 plus years of existence. Built in 1896, kind of like the Pier Store, following the construction of the railroad, it began operations as a general store providing goods to the community until the mid-1930s. Its second floor likely also served as a boarding house for travelers along the Katy. In 1904, an addition was added to the building to house the town bank that later became the town's post office, operating until the mid 2000s. Recently, the historic elevators adjacent to the Mercantile were outfitted with brand new banners with Brian Haynes art. And this fall, the historic Trelor Bar, unfortunately we will be raised to accommodate a new Trelor's Tree Park right next door. We're really excited about that. We want you to come out and see us. There's still time to enjoy the Country Store Quarter this season as we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Katy Trail. Uh, we've got a lot of space out there, a lot of linear space. We're doing a really good job of social distancing. We want you to come out and see this. We'd like to invite you to our Tree Lore Elevator Party on October 18th for a day in the countryside and that feeling that you get when you know you're somewhere worth preserving. We have a saying uh, at Magnificent Missouri um, that we'd like for you to become familiar with. It's called, we'll see you out there. Come out and join us and you'll see it. I think we're gonna show a video now. It's something that uh, that shows our uh, our Pierce Prairie that was kind of the highlight of this year and this challenging, uh, this challenging uh, season that we had turned out to be a real plus. So I hope you enjoy it and I'll turn it over to you, Caitlin. Thanks so much for having me. The Pier Store is in a place along the Katy Trail that we call the Country Store Corridor, a 3.5 mile stretch between the old railroad towns of Piers and Trelor. It's an outpost for Magnificent Missouri's conservation efforts, a destination along the trail for bicyclists, hikers, and adventurists. This year marked the fifth year for the Piers Prairie, a collaboration between Missouri State Parks and Magnificent Missouri. Pierce Prairie is one of the ways Magnificent Missouri promotes conservation throughout Missouri River Country. Come out and see us at our conservation outpost and help us celebrate the Katy Trail on its 30th birthday while spending a day in the countryside. We'll see you out there. Thank you so much, Ralph. Um, I mirror his sentiments. Uh, the Pier Store and Trelor Mercantile and really that whole corridor area is such a, a beautiful place this time of year, um, especially getting into the fall as well when the trees start to turn. Um, so it's a great place to do some socially distanced visiting, uh, get out a just a little bit and, and learn something new um, in, a, in a really great area of Missouri. Um, so thank you so much uh, for everyone who helped us out today with this chapter. Um, but also thanks to everyone who registered in advance for our series. Um, with each chapter, we're going to host a little giveaway to folks who registered in advance. Um, and before we get to some of our q and I want to let you guys know what our giveaway for this week is. Um, so Dan and Connie have generously uh, supplied us with this pair of Magnificent Missouri socks that are featuring um, some flowers that you might find out there at the Pierce Prairie. So. If you register in advance for this series, keep an eye on your email uh, because you could be our winner. So we'll be drawing that winner here in the next several days and getting in contact with you all. So uh, keep an eye out for your email. Uh, we do have a couple questions that have shown up. Um, and uh, Steve, if you're still here with us, um, we have a couple of questions about Missouri River Relief. Um, so Barney asked how people can learn more about Missouri River Relief and what they do. What's the best way to find out about, um, about your organization? Well, thanks for the question, Barney. Um, uh, probably the best way is to hop on our website, which is riverrelief.org, or we also have a Facebook page and Instagram and all that stuff. Um, and we do try to you know, share everything that we have going on. Um, one of the things that we do participate in as well is the Big Muddy Speaker Series, um, which has been online this year. Um, 
and that has its own website, which is bigmoneyspeakers.org. And you can um, learn all kinds of cool stuff about the Missouri River by watching those presentations. Great. Uh, and then Kathy, those overlays that you shared with us that show where the river used to be and where it is now, are those available online somewhere? Uh, no, I just made those today. So um, if uh, if you're interested in those specific maps, um, I can definitely share them with you. My email address is steve at riverleaf.org. So that's Steve at riverrelief.org. Um, go ahead and email me, Kathy or whoever, um, and I can share those old maps and also the, the overlay map. Great, thank you. Uh, the other question we had, someone asked where they can purchase a copy of Growing Up With The River, um, and I went ahead and shared the Magnificent Missouri page with um, both Growing Up With The River and their book, Missouri River Country are both on that page available to be purchased. Uh, I don't see any other questions, so I'll continue on. Um, I want to thank everyone that tuned in for chapter five of Growing Up With The River, especially HECTV for helping us present this program. Special thanks, of course, to our storytellers and authors, Dan and Connie Burkhart, and our guest speakers, Steve Schnarr of Missouri River Relief and Ralph Fremer of Magnificent Missouri. Um, we do have a special kids activity for everyone. Uh, this week is a word search featuring keywords from this chapter. Um, it was taken from an activity book that Dan and Connie created to kind of go along with both the book and their organization, Magnificent Missouri. So that'll be available in the comment or section of the episode. And we'll also upload that to um, the chapter five portion of our website page for the Growing Up With The River program series. Um, if anyone completes that with their kids, feel free to share it on social media and tag Missouri Humanities and Magnificent Missouri. We'd love to see um, anybody who's uh, doing those activities with us. Um, I think that's all we have for today. Uh, no more questions from you guys. So I hope to see you all back next week for chapter six. Uh, thanks again, everyone. We hope you enjoyed it and have a great evening.